as usual, you will you will get um, ten minutes of Q and A from the board, and then five minutes if you need to um, if you need to if uh, for you to share whatever you would need to share. You don't have to use those five minutes, and the board doesn't have to use its ten minutes of questions if they don't if they don't have that many questions. Some of our board um, uh, uh, have uh, issues with the camera, so they won't be on the camera, but that's fine. Um, and we're going to do quick introductions, Jenna, and then I will allow you to introduce yourself before we start the Q&A. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start on the bottom of my screen. Alejandro? Alejandro Prieto, this is my first time on the board, my first year, and I'm sorry about the camera. I'm mobile right now. Hopefully, I'll be in the spot. <laughs> no worries. Christina? Hi, Christina Pacheco, Director, Human Services, and I'm also mobile, but I hopefully will be on camera soon. Awesome. Caitlin. Hi, good evening. Caitlin Abbott, this is my fourth year on the board. Awesome. Kimberly. Hi, I'm Kim Strinka, and this is my third year on the board. Martha. Martha Wilson, and this is my first year on the board. And you know me, Eliberto, and you don't see her, but Brenda Palacio is our executive admin, and she's the one that handles all the scheduling and communicates with you all a lot. So she is on as well. All right, so I'm going to start the timer. And again, uh, the board will have up to 10 minutes. Uh, they don't have to use it, but uh, and then you will have up to five, and you don't have to use that as well. All right, starting timer. Does the board have any questions for, for Jenna? I do. Go ahead. All right, so what are your outreach efforts? And if you can please explain that operation on the day-to-day. -day. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. Um, so our outreach efforts are pretty grassroots. Um, we visit with both school districts and we meet with their counselors and their interventionists to let them know that our services are here. We also meet with a lot of the, probably a lot of the nonprofit organizations that you'll meet with tonight to let them know that our services are available for their young people that are suicidal. Um, we also recently, we had a donor that um, donated money specifically for marketing and for advertising. So we've been fortunate enough to have a campaign created that reaches out to our young people, specifically targeting our 19 year olds and younger. And um, so that's gonna be like, I think on Spotify, it may be during some CU games so we can catch some of those 18 and 19 year olds. Um, it's up on 29th Street Mall. Um, flat irons. I think it'll be in some print. We're going to have some bookmarks and stickers created as well. And I'm going to bring those to schools and libraries and um, stickers to give out to kids. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Kim. Hi, Jenna. I was um, just curious in reading through your application, it seems like you do a lot of great work with um, the Spanish speaking population. And I'm just wondering um, what kind of strategies or if you've seen any resistance and what strategies you use to overcome maybe some cultural barriers to accessing mental health services. So right now we had somebody volunteer that does research and they're doing a research project for us for the Latin A community. Um, so we can learn how to better reach that community. Right now, we about 38% of our youth are Latin A. And um, we're also starting to translate everything into Spanish. And our website um, will also translate into Spanish. Um, but what we really wanna learn is how do we reach those families in a safe way? and let them know about our services. So we're hoping that once um, this kind person finishes the research project, we'll learn a better way to reach them. We also have, I wanna say we're up to eight bilingual therapists now that speak Spanish. So we've also been working really hard on that as well.
All right, so um, I have a question, uh, actually a couple of things. I have a statement and a question. Mm -hmm. uh, the statement is, you know, Jenna, we've been working together for a while um, and I wanna applaud you for the work that uh, that um, Rise Against Suicide has done on mm -hmm. diversifying the board. I know that's been a, that's been a, a, a priority of yours and, and, and I'm looking at, at your board demographics and I feel that you have, you have definitely improved and are working hard on that. So first of all, great for that. Um, then my question was, well, and it's a question that I ask a lot of small agencies, just because it's it's one of my one of my things that that I, I think is important for agencies to think about. I love your strategic goals. The, uh, they talk about the work that you do, but what I want to know and what I want you all to think about as you're developing is what I what I saw was a lot of programmatic goals, and I would love to hear some agency specific goals and they. Things around sustainability, things around, you know, brand development, whatever, just things around how. And I think you you address it a little bit right now in in your in your piece and how your outreach. But just talk to me about what kind of sustainability goals that you you may have as as a board. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a great observation. And I just had a board meeting with my board Tuesday night, and we talked about this. So I think. So you know this, and I'll share this with everyone else. I started in 2019 with this organization. They were about three months from closing their doors. They had $19,000 in the bank. So it's really been a build, and not a lot of people knew about us either. And so I think I have a couple answers to your question. We're finally, I think, fingers crossed, We I think we just hired our last person. So I'll finally have a full team which I've never had. Um, so it's been easy to focus on those program goals, right? Because I've never really been able to sit and be in my position to look at the agency goals. And I mean, we've looked at the agency goals as a board together, but those have all been very, you know, we need to make money, serve kids, make money, serve kids, right? So now we are sitting back and we're saying, how are we getting out in the community more? I would say, that most people still don't know about us. So we are doing this campaign now to reach out to kids. In that, we're also gonna try to reach out to parents with a different campaign. And then eventually we might do a fundraising one, but the kids and the parents and guardians are our top two. So that's in terms of branding. Our website and our logo, we've worked really hard on. We've gotten a lot of compliments from the kids thanking us for not making mental health so dreary and dark. They've, they've thanked us for making it light. Um, and in terms of longevity, um, I mean, we have our long-term goals. I don't think in terms of our program, our program will always stay singular because of what we do. We can't go on a wait list because these kiddos need help immediately. What we might do is start looking at other places that we can help, right? Like the kids at Front Range if they need immediate help with suicide and um, the kids at CU, if they need help with suicide. Um, and then we, of course, we have our fundraising goals, right? That we focus on every year so we can sustain. Um, and I think we're still learning that. We're still in the process of learning all that as well and keeping those numbers, you know, keeping our spreadsheets and our, our QuickBooks and, and looking at those and knowing the first six months we need to make this and the second six months and we have this falling off, ARPA falling off at this time next year. How are we going to fund that? So it's kind of a moving target. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I'm just happy. Like, again, I see these applications every year and and I and I always want to ask this question because I just think it's important for, 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 for boards to be thinking about yeah. Yes, the program is super important. And how do we how do we ensure that the program can be offered in the long term? So, mm -hmm. Christina, you have a question and we have about um, about two minutes left. Yes, I have a couple of questions. Um, one um, is around funding. So um, in looking at your funding, Jenna, um, mm -hmm. have you considered applying for federal and state funding? Um, to diversify your funding. And my second question is about outreach within the school district. So um, I'm aware that, um, you know, sometimes it can be difficult to get into um, 
work uh, within St. Rain Valley School District. And I know um, that there is some concern about um, providing mental health services within the school district now that there might be a move to kind of um, uh, quit that from providing, you know, uh, outside mental health services. So I'm wondering how you um, are going to address those two points, the financial piece and then the St. Rain Valley School District piece. So we have not um, considered federal or state yet. I think okay. that might be come part of a plan once we have a full team and we okay. can really take that bigger, look at it from a bigger scope. Um, in terms of St. Brain Valley School District, you are correct. They have a new policy in place that um, makes it more challenging for our therapists to be allowed to go in and see those kiddos in school. They have a policy about um, a young person being considered medically, it being medically necessary for a young person to be seen in the school. So um, what we're doing is we are still seeing kids if they're referred by them. Um, we're keeping an eye on it. Like last year we served in the city of Longmont, we served 125 kids, but in St. Rain Valley School District, we served 165 kids and we funded 271,000 therapy sessions for them. So now that this is coming into play, you know, Christina, we have to look at numbers and we're going to have to keep an eye and see if those numbers go down. Okay. We're, um, we're going to do the best we can with it. We're really hoping that we can still stay. And if we don't, there's absolutely no reason that we will pull out of Longmont. We will just have okay. to get creative. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. All right. so, and our time is up for those 10 minutes. I'll give you, you, I'll start your five right now, Jenna. And you can share whatever you want to share with the board. Okay. Um, I, first of all, I just want to thank you all for um, taking the time to sit with me. I really appreciate it. And thank you for um, caring about our organization because um, we are pretty small and we're pretty grassroots. Um, I, like I just shared, you know, in the city of Longmont, we uh, had 125 referrals and we funded 1,360 sessions. And um, in St. Frank Valley School District alone, we, we had 165 referrals and over 2,000 funded sessions. So there are a lot of kids in Longmont that need help and we're grateful to be there for them. Um, I think it's important maybe to share that we partner with CORE in Longmont and the Longmont Youth Center we um, partner with, and we partner with um, St. Rain Valley School District. And we're gonna work on more partnerships in Longmont because we need to be central up there. And these kids need to know that we're here to help them and that they're not alone. It's really, really important to us. And oh, and we have a holiday star program coming up. This is a little pitch, Alberto, I'm sorry, but it's all right. um, we have the holiday star coming up. And we go to businesses and put up trees and starry walls and ask people to give the gift of mental health um, as a fundraiser. If anybody knows of any businesses that would want a starry wall or a tree, just let Eliberto know and he can let me know and I'll email you or maybe he can connect us because I would yeah, be happy to connect anybody who wants to do that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So that's us. I know my time's up. I'll be quiet. All right. Thank you so much, Jennifer, uh, being here tonight. We appreciate yeah. your organization and what you do in the community. So have Thank a good you, rest everyone. of your night. Thanks. You too. Bye. All right. And we actually have people who've been waiting in the waiting room for the last 15 minutes as well, <laughs> uh, which is our next group, uh, Boulder Valley Health. So you want to let them in? Thank you. 
All right. Savita, can you hear us? All right, great. Uh, so good evening. Uh, thank you for um, you. joining us tonight. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things that we're going to do real quick before we get started. So this is this is the public hearing for uh, Housing and Human Services funding applications. Uh, so it is being recorded uh, and will be on the city's U YouTube website. I'm going to go ahead and mute you, Savita, because I hear some background. All right. All right, thank you. Um, so um, we're going to give you 10 minutes um, of Q&A time from the board, and then we'll have five minutes um, at the end for you to share what uh, anything you want to share to the board. I'll give you a chance right before we get started to introduce yourselves. I'm going to quickly introduce, uh, let the board members introduce themselves and staff, and then we'll get started. So uh, why don't we start this way? I'll start. It, it, it shifted on me here. So we'll start with Caitlin first. Hi, good evening. I'm Caitlin Abbott. This is my fourth year on the um, Housing and Human Services Advisory Board. Kimberly. Good evening. I'm Kim Stringa, and this is my third year on the advisory board. Oh, she says that Savita can't hear anything. Uh, I'm not sure what to do about that. Um... Oh, yeah, no, okay. All right, we're good. Uh, Martha. Martha Wilson, and this is my first year on the board. Awesome. Alejandro. Alejandro Prieto, this is my first year on the board. Christina. Christina Pacheco, Human Services Director. I've been in the position since December, but with the city since 1999. And I'm mobile right now. Um, I should be at my computer here soon, though. Awesome. And I'm Aliberto Mendoza, project coordinator, and you can't see her, but Brenda is, uh, Palacio is our uh, executive admin, and she does all the scheduling and behind the scenes work. I'm sure you've communicated with her several times. I'll let you introduce yourselves, and then we'll start the 10 minutes for the Q&A. Sure. So I'm um, Dr. Savita Ginde. I am the CEO and the Chief Medical Officer at Boulder Valley Health Center. I've been there for uh, a little bit over a year. Um, prior to that, I had actually been on the board for um, Boulder Valley Health Center and have a long history in reproductive health and family planning, as well as with FQHCs and, and running some other um, organizations. So pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting us. Erin, do you want to do a quick intro? Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Erin Wilson. I'm the development coordinator over at BEVHC. I'm pretty new to the team. I've been there for a couple of months. I helped with this grant and Eliberto and Christina and Brenda, I met you guys at the senior center when you had that nonprofit group. So awesome. thanks for having me. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and start the timer if the board has any questions. And again, we don't have to use the whole 10 minutes. They're, that's just our limits. Uh, okay, Martha first, Martha first, then Kim, then Alejandro. Um, I was trying to just unpack in my mind what this was. Is it closest to like a respite program where it's temporary um, stabilization services after a crisis? Uh, I don't know. Are we, what are we talking about? Um. Is there a way to just capture what it is that you are like um, as an organization? Uh -huh. Like it wasn't clear. There was a list of services, but it wasn't yeah. clear, like one specific focus. Uh, well, Boulder Valley, we're actually originally, you might, if you know the community, we were Boulder Valley Women's Health Center. We took the women's out. So we're now Boulder Valley Health Center, your community reproductive and sexual health clinic. And so we are celebrating our 50th year this year in our community. Um, we provide reproductive and sexual health services for Boulder County, um, as well as now having patients come to us from outside of the state, just because of the state of our union uh, nationally. But um, we do comprehensive reproductive and sexual health care, as well as classroom education, comprehensive classroom sex education. I'm sorry if that wasn't clear in in our description. I think it was more so like I couldn't tell if, for instance, you're mailing things or if people are physically coming here to get the product. Yeah. And then go like that part I was not sure about. 
Yeah, so our primary um, uh, population tends to be those who are low income, monolingual Spanish speakers, LGBTQ plus populations, or anyone who tends to have um, challenges in accessing health care. We provide subsidized uh, health services, as well as then, of course, accepting Medicaid um, and insurances. But we do have sliding fee scale, which is one of our biggest draws for many community members. Um, so hence, we provide in-clinic, in-person care, but sometimes the outreach has to be um, modified and able to reach populations who might not use traditional methods because of language and translation challenges or otherwise, which is why we do mailings or use our community partnerships in order to make sure that we're actually reaching the communities that might need us most. Thank you. Kim. Mm -hmm. Um, I just think it's incredible that you're the only Title X provider in all of Colorado. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. Um, and by extension of that, in terms of offering gender affirming um, hormone therapy, I see that you offer that to adults. Is there any discussion about offering that, that to youth? And if there isn't, where do youth go for that service? Yeah. Um, so obviously in terms of being the only Title X provider, uh, abortion provider in the state of Colorado, I think it just speaks to the back end somersaults that we have to do in order to make sure that we are not commingling funds because that's one of the requirements. And so that's why I was a chief medical officer at Planned Parenthood for 14 years. So I kind of know the why they don't, they are not a Title X provider for that very reason. Um, and so it's just a challenge. Um, in terms of making sure that we can provide both services to the patients that want it. Um, in terms of gender affirming hormone therapy, we actually are starting to, as long as we have parental approval of both parents, um, we'll provide uh, supportive gender affirming hormone therapy care to um, anyone who comes to us, including teens. We actually just recently had a teen from out of state because it is a national crisis um, who wanted services from us. And as long as we have cons consent from parents, um, we're okay supporting that as long as we also have any other endocrinologist or anyone else who needs to be involved to make sure that we're meeting the needs of that teen and keeping them healthy at such a young age. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, Alejandro's next, but is he in the waiting room? Brenda? <laughs> Yeah, I just got to the office, so if you could. Okay, so why don't you? Okay. This dude is like a global at this point. All right, so why don't we, Kayla? Why don't you ask your question while he's getting set up? Hi, thanks for being here tonight, and for all the work that you do. I know the landscape has changed um, significantly in the last few years. Um, I think one of the things. So I was on the board last year when you applied, and I think one. I, I remember one of the things we we talked about. I think was an increase in the need for SPI testing um, in particular, and just, you know, sort of the, I think we, we talked, uh, you talked a little bit about it being sort of post COVID. A lot is changing. It's, it looks like you're, you know, tell me how you're balancing the various um, needs. Cause I think your program covers, you know, so you've got gender affirming within this single program, you've got gender affirming healthcare, you've got, you know, various STI testing as well as, education how are you balancing those various needs and the things that are changing almost it seems like weekly um in the landscape for these um so we we run a super tight ship um we make sure that we are reaching patients for exactly what they need um we have integrated all these services for the most part together except for of course um we have a whole separate team who does our classroom education. Um, I will say we are so excited this year to actually be in St. Vrain Valley School District because we've had some issues getting in there for our comprehensive sex ed. And to be invited into three of the schools this year for 2023 to 2024 is like an amazing achievement. I think that speaks to the hard work of our teen and community programs team. Um, we are, uh, you know, it, it's we sort of make sure that we're checking all the boxes age appropriate for the um correct and appropriate uh, preventive care needs of whoever's coming to us. So a teen, according to CDC guidelines, less than 25 years old need to get tested for STI screening. And the regularity with which that happens depends on you know, what behaviors they have um, in regards to their sexual health. And so we vet all of those. Um, 
we have really clear sort of screening guidelines and, and processes and efficiencies in our system that start with their first contact with our um, scheduling staff all the way through to when they come into our office that we're making sure that we're evaluating them. And then some of these tests can be done off of urine or can be done really easily so they don't create challenges for us and that we are trying to utilize um, the best uh, and most efficient methods that we can to make sure that Patients are getting tested for what they need to and that we have treatments available or treatment resources available um, should they need anything in regards to this STI testing. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and, and are you continuing to see an increase in um, those STIs um, and the testing needs there or has that changed? No, I mean the rightfully so, and 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 I guess you know appropriate to you know just what's happening across the country is we are seeing a lot of folks, um, and I guess I'm always so proud of them to come in and get tested, um, to to have the, all their needs and concerns and the questions addressed, so they know exactly. There's a lot of um, what's the word I'm looking for? A, a lot of people taking some full responsibility for making sure that they're healthy and well. I don't know if that's post COVID or whatever, but there's a lot of folks coming in with some good questions and wanting to make sure that they're tested and screened, for instance, before they get involved in relationships or if something changes on them. And so I think it's it's a testament to our being a safe place for a lot of people in the community and a testament, I think, to people really owning their health and being able to come in and ask the right questions and get tested for things that they're concerned about. So we are seeing increased testing. We're actually in the process of um, looking at the free testing that we get from the state, CDPHE does give us some free testing credits. Um, and so making sure that those are increasing in proportion to what we're seeing. Thank you. I will add as a caveat to all oh. of this is that, you know, we used to have a clinic in Longmont that we had, we had, we closed. It wasn't the most accessible location. And so it is a very high on my list. It's on higher my priority if we can actually find space um, you know, to come back into the community because I think there's direct need there. And I know that some of those patients can't travel to us. So we're really trying to bridge that gap. And I have been in touch with like Robin Bohannon, for instance, because she said she was doing an assessment of like all the empty space and who's using what and who's doing what. Because I said, do you even have space to give me like a couple of rooms? Um, we'll come in and, and establish ourselves there. So we're really accessible to the community. That's That's our goal. Awesome. Uh, we got about a minute left. Alejandro, you had a question as well? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it got answered. Uh, okay. I was concerned because, uh, you know, I'm I'm, an, I'm a 70 kid, so I grew up during the, the AIDS epidemic, you know, like it was a big thing and HIV was huge and, you know, I got taught to strap it all the time, um, but I've seen, and it's very, very, um, nerve-wracking to see that uh, the youth in today's world you know like you see rises in syphilis and other stds stis um and it's just scary i was just wondering how you're educating and how you how you spreading you know that um that safe practice Lost yeah, I mean, just real, real succinctly, I can tell you that that's really part of the big conversations that we're having in these schools. And again, we're so excited to be back in St. Brain um, School District in those three schools this year. Um, otherwise, last year has been really tough for us to get in, but it's a big part. We do not only the comprehensive sex education, make sure that um, we answer all the questions that teens might have, invite them into the clinic and let them know how they can access us including having um, systems in place to get people to the clinic if they have ride issues or anything else. Um, but I mean, that's a big part of it. And I can tell you that another part of what we're looking at right now is doing um, what's called point of care testing on the HIV. So it could be done on the spot as, as well as with the syphilis. So it's a quick turnaround and people have their answers. Um, so, so I'm yeah, going to go ahead and go ahead and start the five minute clock. Um, anything else you want to share? No, unless you have any other questions for us. No, this is your time. Uh, All right. Aaron, we did you have anything before we sign off? I don't think so. I think you covered it really well. Okay. All right. We Thanks don't so have much to for use having those five minutes. Yeah, thank yeah. you for being here tonight and have a great rest of your night. Thank, thank you, you very too. much. Bye. Bye. Okay, we are, we are just... We are going through these. We are just like two minutes behind this time. That's good. That is great. All right. So the next is BCAP. You want to let them in, Brenda?
Hello, folks. Hey, Frank. Hey, Sarah. So welcome. Um, the little, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, as you know, you've been doing this for many years. This is a this is a public hearing technically, so it is being recorded and will be on the City of Longmont's uh, YouTube page at some point. Um, we're going to do a quick uh, introductions of the board and staff, and then we'll give you a chance to, to introduce yourselves. And then we will uh, we have 10 minutes of Q&A, uh, which we don't have to use if there's not that many questions. If there are, we will. And then we'll have give you five minutes to share whatever uh, you want to share. And again, you don't have to use that, um, but we'll, we'll make sure that you have that. Um, so let's get started with introductions. I'm going to start um, again on my bottom, Caitlin. Hi, Caitlin Abbott. This is my fourth year on the board. Nice to see you all. Alejandro. Alejandro Prieto, first year on the board. Hello. Kim. Hi, I'm Kim Strenka. This is my third year on the board. Martha. Martha Wilson. This is my first year on the board. Christina. Christina Pacheco, Human Services Director. I've been in the position since December, um, but with the city since 1999. And you all know me. Uh, you also know Brenda. You can't see her, but she is our wizard behind the scenes that schedules all these and connects with you all uh, quite often. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start the timer. And uh, board, if you have any questions, you all can uh, kick it off. Kim. And then Alejandro. Hi, um, I enjoyed reading your application and I had just two questions. One is a general question around um, the stigma that's been around HIV and if you've seen that change, perceptions change and um, if that's changed your programming and your outreach. And then my second question is around um, affordability and access to PrEP. I know that's been a really difficult thing for folks to get in the past and I'm wondering how you connect people who really need to, to be on prep and um, make it so that it's more accessible. Sarah, would you like to take the first question and I'll take the second? You're on mute. That helps unmute. <laughs> um, hi, Kimberly, thank you for your questions. Um, yeah, I, I think stigma is a hard thing to measure really, but we do definitely still, um, just in speaking with our clients, hear stories on a regular basis of people, you know, facing stigmas, whether it's with uh, providers, healthcare providers, friends, family, um, schools, et cetera. I mean, it's just pervasive throughout our society and it might look different or less blatant or more blatant. It's, it's just challenging that I think to measure it. Um, that said, I mean, I feel like if, if really it were at an all time low, we'd be having no, you know, more and more and more people would just consider getting tested, for example, um, something they just ought to do for their health and not worry about all the associated issues related to, but, um, that's what comes to my mind right now. I mean, I don't know, Frank, what do you, anything to add to that? I think it's so multi-layered and it can get compounded depending on how many um, identities and lived experience um, and social determinant of health that people are navigating. So um, LGBTIQ people living with HIV might experience stigma differently than people who use and inject drugs and don't have that identity. Um, people living in poverty experience compounded stigma but we do know it's something that um, folks are very anxious about and there is a trepidation and oftentimes a delay in accessing services and care because of the stigma mm -hmm. and so it does take a lot of outreach and messaging and um, networks of people um, promoting um, kind of where science is at and that services are accessible and that people can get on medication and um, repress the virus and not transmit the virus and and live a, a healthier life. Right, and we, we do put a lot, sorry, go ahead. 
I was still very active in real stigma. Around yeah. Me. And I do think too, just real quickly that um, we put a lot of energy into building rapport with um, community partners and healthcare providers in the region and with clients that we're serving, prevention clients, as well as care clients, so that people can better trust the referrals we're making and we're trying and, and can trust that we are linking them directly to people who will treat them as human beings. Thank you, and, Alejandro and then Caitlin. Oh, oh, should, alongside the um, question around prep, should I answer that one? Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Oh. Um, so BCAP it is the only organization or public health entity in the Boulder County region that has a prep services navigator. And so we worked with Boulder County Public Health to identify that gap and that need and, and Boulder County as well, but to, um, and to seek sustainable funding around that position um, that um, also is, is staffed by someone who's bilingual to help with equitable access. But essentially in terms of prep, um, there's a state drug assistance program that does provide um, access, um, financial support and our access to PrEP for people who, for an individual who makes roughly like $60,000 or less. So um, that there is a state system in place that can help with access. A lot of people don't know about it. They don't know how to navigate it. They don't know how to utilize their insurance um, how to find a doctor. So we have a comprehensive um, prep services program that does marketing, education, group level education, and individual screening, navigation, linkage to medical care, retention and care, health insurance assistance, like all those components that are needed to help um, make people more aware of prep and, and get them linked to services. Thank you. Go ahead, Alejandro. Yeah. He just answered my question. <laughs> okay, all right. Caitlin. Thank you. Hello, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I noticed in your, um, both in your budget narrative and in the budget for this program um, that you know, you're know you increasing the budget for this program due to increased costs. Um, I don't have previous ones available. Can you tell me, tell us a little bit about where those increased costs are coming from. Um, you know, I it looks like it's across the board, but where's sort of the biggest place you're seeing the need um, to, to put additional money in here? There's a few areas that kind of rise to the surface. Um, one of the greatest, biggest challenges through COVID was staff retention inflation, rising cost of living in this county. So there definitely is an investment in staff wages and benefits. Um, there's also, we have just also seen increased need with the people who are accessing our services, particularly low income people living with HIV, needing housing assistance, um, transportation, basic needs assistance, but there is a really big gap with access to oral health care. And that's an area that we've stepped up and increased our budget. Um, and then uh, harm reduction services, the opioid epidemic, the adulterants and the illicit drug market are really driving a lot of, men uh, well, they're making mental health issues worse. And the, um, the physical, um, and medical impacts of the drugs are much harder. We're seeing people just in with higher acuity, um, just needing more support in the moment and needing more like just ready to eat food and hydrating beverages in that moment to hopefully avoid um, ending up in an emergency room, essentially, like just that acute need. And, um, and we're just seeing more people in this region um, accessing harm reductions and syringe access services. So medical supply, wound care supplies, um, basic need items like toiletries, um, that's an area. And then our, our, our food pantry budget has shown professional increase as well. Great, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, then we can go to your uh, five minutes, Frank. Uh, if that's okay with you. 
And I'll go ahead and start. I'll go ahead and start that. So is there anything you'd like to start with? Mm, sure. Well, uh, yeah, <clears throat> I was just thinking that, um, you know, the first quarter of last year, we were still under some pretty restrictive COVID uh, protocols for BCAP that BCAP still had in place on purpose um, and paying attention to the epidemic, the numbers, et cetera and uh, wanting to protect our small our small staff and our vulnerable populations that we serve. But then as of like mid-April, mid we reduced those because it made a lot of sense. Um, and I'm just wanting to share that I feel really proud of our staff for having uh, been able to increase their um, contacts and reconnections and including new connections with community partners and and how many off-site testing sites for example we're up to now like 15 potentially 16 I think there's one in the works so it just feels like the staff have really um, been putting their all into building BCAP back up to where it was pre-COVID and it's it's been tough but just wanted to share that. Throughout the pandemic, we've, you know, um, oscillated between like 66% of our staff in level to 80%. We've stayed there for a long time. And right now we're like 94%. We have one vacancy that we're vetting candidates for and we'll have a, that position filled soon and we'll be back up to full staffing. And that is just something that's just, it's been since March, 2020, we've been experiencing that journey and the, the department heads and the leadership just filling in for those vacancies and maintaining those scopes of work. And then the staff, frontline staff, just the vulnerable positions that they've been in throughout the pandemic, um, just some, something to just really be recognized across, across health and human services and, and the work that's being done. Um, but we're really at a place of, of stabilization coming out of the pandemic. And I think that's just really important to, to share with, with funders right now. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. If nothing else, we will let you go for the rest of the evening and we're grateful for you being here. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time as well and your attention. Welcome. All right. Have a great Bye. night. Thank you so much. <laughs> you too. It's wonderful to see you all. Bye. Thanks. Have a good evening. So, um, so we have one more before we have a break, uh, and they're in the waiting room. Um, and so we will have basically, I think, a 15 minute break I, uh, after we get, right? Is that right, Brenda? Um, half an That's hour. What I was, Oh, no, 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 Have... no, 15 minutes. Sorry. 15 could... minutes. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. That's what I thought was because we start, we start back, we're going to get done and then we start back at 645. So let's go ahead and let Shelly in. She's from, um, um, uh, St. Benedict's health ministry. Hey Shelly, uh, nice nice to see you this evening. Welcome. Can you hear us? Thank you. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, uh, as you know, these are public hearings, so it is being recorded and will be on our our uh, City of Longmont um, YouTube channel. Um, we're gonna do as usual. You get ten minutes of Q and A from the board. We don't have to use all those 10 minutes if the board doesn't have that many questions. And then you get five minutes to share uh, whatever you want to share about your organization. And again, you don't have to use that if, if you have shared what you felt you need to share. Uh, we're going to do quick introductions, and then I'll let you introduce yourself right before we start the question and answer session. That sound okay? Sounds good. Thank you. All right. So uh, let's start on my top right, Alejandro. Alejandro Prieto, first year on the board. Kim. Hey, Shelly, I'm Kim Strenga. This is my third year on the board. Martha. Martha Wilson, this is my first year on the board. Caitlin. 
Hi, I'm Caitlin Abbott. This is my fourth year on the board. Christina. Christina Pacheco, Human Services Director, and I've been with the city since 1999 and in this position since December. Awesome, Michelle, you know me, Alberto, and I think you also know Brenda. She is behind the scenes making the magic happen. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start the timer, and whoever wants to go first, I see Alejandro already has his hand up. Go ahead, Alejandro. Um, so, yeah, I was reading you got great outreach efforts um, on your application, but I'm wondering, do you meet um, unhoused individuals where they are? Like, I know you, you provide the free clinic and everything, um, but do you do any street medicine or anything yeah. like that? Yeah, Alejandro, thank you. That's a great question. So I've been the executive director for the past three years, and I apologize. I'm having trouble with my video working. Um, so we... And I, when I took over in the first year of the pandemic in 2020, we added a mobile clinic because we were uh, locked out of all of our public places where we used to hold clinic. And so we do outreach on a regular basis all over Boulder County. <clears throat> but within the city of Longmont, uh, we partner with Hope and with the Hour Center. And we do outreach with Hope. Great. Um, yeah, so I hope to yeah work with you sometime in the near future. Thank you. All Me right. too. Caitlin. Hi, Shelly. Nice to virtually see you again. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about, um, you know, coming out of the pandemic, you, you had the mobile clinic, you've been doing um, a lot of this outreach. Are there any trends or things that you're seeing since, you know, last year that um, that you're trying to get ahead of or address um, or that are, you know, sort of big um, in your mind for the these um, clinics that you're offering? Yeah, Caitlin, good to see you, too. Um, we this year, <clears throat> with a lot of people losing COVID benefits and Medicaid roll offs, our prescription drug program coverage has gone through the roof. I, we've had it ever since I started and we maybe did 10, 15 prescriptions a year. Now we've done over a hundred prescriptions. So we pay for uh, the copay or up to hundred percent of the cost of any needed medication for anyone. So no questions asked. There are no requirements. I mean, we do like everything we do, we're trying to be gap coverage. So we hope that people get enrolled in Medicaid or Medicare or find prescription drug coverage for the long term. But we have seen a huge increase in that in the last year. And a lot of our partners have been calling us. And, you know, it's as simple as if there's a prescription waiting to be picked up at the pharmacy, we'll call in and pay for it over the phone and people just go and pick up their medications. So it's been really rewarding. We've always had that. And the other piece that's really taken off or we've just seen a need is our preventative care program. We really expanded on that in 2020. And this year, we've already given out over $30,000 in preventative care supplies. So not just toothbrushes and toothpaste and lotion and soap and shampoo and hand sanitizer masks, but blankets and socks and clothing you know, it rained a lot in May and June. We gave out a ton of rain jackets and umbrellas and waterproof blankets and things like that. So yeah, it just keeps evolving and feel really blessed to do this work. So Shelly, I have I have a couple a statement and, and some questions. You're yes. one of those agencies that we've been working with for a while um, on, on uh, you know, in diversifying your board and, and you've done a really tremendous job of, of, of really diversifying that board. So kudos to you and, and the work that you've done. Um, and my question is around your strategic goals and in particular, something that we've talked about, you and I've talked about before. Um, and, and, you know, for the board to know, you you are under the auspices, your 501c3 is under the auspices of the Episcopalian Church of America. And, and I'm just wondering if, if you and your board are having those conversations about 
we've talked about in the past about becoming an independent 501c3 um, and, and, and see where you are with that. Just wanted to check in with you on that. Yeah. Yeah, great question. So for everybody that doesn't know, we've been around 20 years and we were founded by an Episcopal priest who was also a nurse. And so our 501c3 is under the Episcopal church, but for all intents and purposes, everything we do legally is not tied to the church. So we're in this conundrum of being in limbo and we want to get out and be our own independent 501c3, but the church still provides over half of our income. And so we're in this place of, it's a financial piece. We'd love to, and I think the church is willing to give us their blessing because we used to get a lot of support from independent church members. And now there's just some longstanding grants that fall under the Episcopal church that we get, um, but it's over a hundred thousand dollars a year. So we're, we're not able to walk away from that yet, but we definitely are having those conversations we want to do that. Our board, because we're diversified now, we don't have as many Episcopalian church members as we're supposed to. And um, I tell the board, well, or the, I tell the diocese, look, I, I being a diverse board is more important to the work that we do and serving the people that we serve than meeting the diocese and requirements. And they kind of understand that, but we're always being pulled in two different directions. And so we, we really do want to be our own independent. We just have got to get that financial. Oh, did we lose Shelly? Can you hear me? Oh yeah, there you are. Okay. D thank you. Yeah. No, I, I, I totally understand that. I just, I, we talked about it a couple of years and I just wanted to just check in on that. Yeah. The minute we can figure out our funding, we're out of there. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't, I necessarily don't think there's anything wrong with it, but I also think that, you know, it, it, it may, it, it may give you some more other opportunities as well. Right. So I, I don't yeah. think there's anything wrong with you being part of the Episcopalian church. I mean, your, your work is, 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 is completely separate and your board is independent. Um, yes. So, but, well, and we don't, you know, we, we don't proselytize at all. I'm always telling people we want to be known as St. Benedict health not health and healing ministry. We're not a ministry. We're a healthcare organization. So it is, you know, there's a lot, a lot of reasons why it would benefit us to be independent. And we do want to get right. there. We have about two and a half minutes left. Any other questions? And and if we don't have any, we can go on to giving Shelly her time too, but. Okay. Well, I just want to check in real quick. Um, you said you're working with hope. How is that going? I, I think we're, I think in Longmont, we are seeing more and more people experiencing homelessness and, and, and then also seeing an increase in those that are unsheltered. In other words, they don't necessarily want to engage with sheltering. How is, how is your work with hope trying to hopefully trying to reach that, that demographic? Yeah, we don't have as long of a trust relationship with the clients of hope. You know, at the Hour Center, it's the same people that have been seeing us for years and years and they know us. And so when we've done our outreach, sometimes they're a little bit skeptical. They'll take socks from us, but maybe aren't necessarily willing to talk about getting a vaccine or having their blood pressure taken. So I feel like we've got to really continue to ramp that up, our outreach. And, you know, we're open to any partnerships to be able to do that because we clearly do see the levels of homelessness rising across all of Boulder County you know, not just Longmont and we know the right. need is there and, you know, so. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we've, we, yeah, we need to build on that for sure. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'll give you your five minutes. If there's no other questions. Again, you don't have to use them all, but if you want to share anything with the board, this is your time to do it. Yeah. I mean, I think I, we've received funding from, the Health and Human Services Board the last couple of years, it's been huge for us. So I wanted to first thank you for that. Um, tell you that without that, we wouldn't have been able to meet all, all of the prescription drugs we've covered this year or hand out all the personal care items. So it's the funding you give us is meaningful. Um, and we appreciate that. We're, we're wanting to also grow our volunteer clinicians 
So all of our nurses, our physicians, our nurse practitioners, even a physical therapist or volunteers, um, mostly retired, which is great because they still have their license active and they have time. Anytime I bring on younger providers, they'll volunteer for six months or so and then feel they get pulled in a lot of directions. You know, there's just so much pressure on any practicing healthcare provider. So I'm always looking for those connections. I mean, we've got more requests for clinics than we can meet right now. So that's a big focus in the coming year is to really continue to grow our pool of clinicians. Prior to the pandemic, we had 35. And since the pandemic, we've hovered between 15 and 20 clinicians. So just want you guys to know that's a challenge and a priority for us. And if you know anyone, send them our way. We'd love to have them. Thank you so much, Shelly. Well, I think if there's nothing else, then you can have a great rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Appreciate the interview. Sorry about my video. No Look worries. To you all totally again. understand that. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. All right. So we are doing good on time. It's 629. And so we're about a minute ahead of time. Uh, and so we're not expected to be here until 6.45. I didn't get here like 6.44 a minute before just to make sure we're all, um, that would be great. But we are we are good. We got a good 15 minute break. Hey, Bruce. Can you How hear me? You? All right. Well, welcome. Uh, is Marty joining us or is it just you tonight? It is just me. Okay, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure. Uh, so do, do a, a couple of housekeeping things um, up front. Yeah, as you know, this is a public hearing, uh, which means that it is being recorded uh, and will be available on the on the city's uh, YouTube page. Uh, we're gonna you're gonna have ten minutes of Q and A from the board, and then you'll have five minutes. For you to share whatever you'd like to share, uh, we don't have to use those ten minutes or the five minutes. Uh, if we get through it uh, sooner, that is fine as well. Uh, so you've caught us kind of, uh, you know, this is a long meeting for our board, and some folks are having dinner <laughs> as we as we. So some folks may be off camera. Uh, no disrespect meant to. They're just yeah, it's a long, two almost three hour meeting. So, um, just so you're aware of that. Um, so I'm gonna qu quickly introduce folks. I'm gonna start with the folks that are on camera, and then I'll I'll go that way. So I'll start Kim. Good evening. My name is Kim Strenka, and this is my third year on the advisory board. Alejandro. Oh, you're muted, buddy. Waste of air. Alejandro Prieto. This is my first year on the board. Awesome, Caitlin. Hi, I'm Caitlin Abbott. This is my fourth year on the board. Awesome. Martha. Martha Wilson, this is my first year on the board. All right, Christina. Christina Pacheco, I'm the Human Services Director, and I have been in this position since December, but with the city since 1999. All right, and Bruce, you know me, I'm Alberto Mendoza, project coordinator, and you don't see her, but she is the magician that figures things out in the background. That's uh, Brenda Palacio. She is the one who coordinated these schedules. Um, so why don't you introduce yourself real quick, and I'm going to set the timer up for the questions. Sure. I'm Bruce Parker. I'm the deputy director at Boulder County. I've been here for about two years. Um, I have a PhD in education, and my background is in um, government and nonprofit work. I was in community programs in Louisiana governor's office and I've done LGBT and progressive work in five states. Awesome. All right. I started the timer. Uh, any questions from the board? Go ahead, Alejandro. Okay. All over the place today. Out Boulder, right? Yes. Right. Awesome. So uh, thank you for the work that you all do over there. I am a father, a proud father of a trans um, child. Uh, how do you reach the unhoused community? Um, it's funny, Alejandro, the meeting that I stepped out of was with the parents of trans kids, actually, um, is going on in our, in our basement right now. Um, 
the coolest thing for me when I first came here was that we had launched the point, our behavioral health and case management services. And it actually um, ends up primarily reaching unhoused folks. And our director of behavioral health, Tamara Tannehill, was with Together before. And so she comes with sort of a rich um, history in that work. And so it kind of infuses everything we do, actually. Um, it's it's one of the things I think we do particularly well. And so I wouldn't say that we even have a unique outreach um, program for that. I think that we actually reach them with our trans support work, our behavioral health services, our cutie pock programming. Um, I think we probably could do some work to reach youth who are unhoused a little more effectively, but it, it's one of the things I think we do remarkably well. And it just infuses everything we do. We have relationships with groups that serve them and it's core to what we do. We don't charge for any of our services. Awesome. Any other questions? Hi, Bruce. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, Eliberto, sorry, I half raised my hand and then jumped in. Um, no worries. <laughs> um, Bruce, I'm curious um, if you could talk a little bit about how, um, from your perspective, this um, the, the services for trans folks um, differs maybe or you know dovetails but maybe require what why why this is why is this a separate um sort of programming as compared to some of the other lgbtq um work that outboulder does yeah um i think it's a really really difficult time to be trans in our country and i think that it's interesting i think that i don't know that it's ever been easy but I think it used to be invisible. And now I think there's a target on people. And so even if our state is not pursuing those policies, there's a behavioral health impact on people. There is an increased risk of suicide, self-harm. That's even more severe for our um, um, trans people of color and trans youth. And um, it, it's just pivotal that we get it right. And, and the exciting thing for me was having been here two years and doing trans-based work in education and in the community is actually how I got started doing advocacy. I was partnered with a trans man for 10 years in my twenties. And um, it's it's just life or death for folks. It was then and it is now. And out Boulder County with the support of Boulder County and local organizations have actually been getting it right for trans people for a while. And so writing this year's grant was exciting for me because it it really is about taking what we've been doing well and moving past it. So we're not just trying to help people survive at this point, we're trying to help people thrive. And that looks like affinity groups to reach specific populations who have shared commonalities. It looks like more deep education about access to healthcare resources. Um, it looks like dealing with the reality that even in Colorado, which is one of the bastions right now for trans healthcare, um, children's hospital just discontinued their services. Um, and so these, these threats are real and um, it is easy to subsume them into LGB issues and then actually ignore the reality that trans people have to change documentation. They have different basic needs challenges. They're the most discriminated against a group. And then when you factor in the fact that, again, trans people of color, it, the numbers are just startling for me. And so um, I am excited that we are in a posture where we are getting to try to expand on what we're doing and not just maintain it. I hope that actually answered your question. No, thank you. That, that That's helpful. This is bringing big, like I used to testify to the legislature in Louisiana, and this is making me feel like that. I'm like, okay, but all of you are kind of on my side. <laughs> <laughs> so Bruce, I, I, I have a question. Um, you know, just a little context. The board is looking at your program and they're going to ask program questions. I'm going to ask more agency level type of questions. And when I read your, when I, and, and so help me understand a little bit. I know that, you know, you all, Out Boulder has been a big recipient of, you know, CARES dollars, CVRF dollars, ARPA dollars. And I'm wondering strategically, as you think about strategic planning, um, what, 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 what happens when that, that funding goes away? Uh, what are you all thinking? I know you've grown tremendously due to some great federal infusions, uh, but what happens when that is no longer there? Um. 
Alberto, it's funny. I told Marty today the only thing I was nervous about was you on this call because you helped me with my deliverables last year and you were very good at getting into the detail. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think well, it would be dishonest to say that we aren't thinking about that every day um, and trying to figure out to make sure that what we're doing is sustainable. What, what I will tell you is our funding streams remain diverse. Our individual donations are going up. Our corporate donations are going up. And we are weaving together a pretty interesting combination of federal money, state money, local money, and uh, foundation money. And um, I think that we are positioned to be exceedingly sustainable. Um, and the way you measure that in the nonprofit world is, are your individual donations going up when your sort of contracts and grants do? And they are. Um, it, it's a point of stress for a development team. Um, I think Marty wishes tomorrow and I would stop writing grants, to be honest, for a minute, because it's like, okay, we just keep expanding what we're doing. So we have to then match it to make it sustainable. I think we've done that. I think um, the organization is growing in a smart and strategic way, but very quickly. Um, we are up to, I believe, 22 staff members. And when I got here, I was the eighth, and that was just two years ago. Oh, so, yeah, I hope your board is thinking about sustainability. I mean, that's one of the dangers of nonprofits when they grow too fast, right? They're offering amazing services, but the growth is not sustainable. Um, so, so, yeah, I think that, that answers my questions. Thank you. We have about two and a half minutes left. Uh, does anybody else have uh, any questions for uh, Bruce? Uh, if not, we can go to his time. All right, so I'm going to stop our 10 minute um, timer. Oh. oh, go ahead, Martha. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, hi. Uh, uh, a couple of my kiddos are um, in the LGBTQ community, and they reminded me that today um, is the um, memorial day um, for uh, Matthew Shepard. Um, so I just wanted to. Um, acknowledge the work you do with regard to um, violence and internalized um, feelings and um, protecting everyone in this community and um, really just acknowledge the suicidal component that was very well captured in your application. Thank you. Um, Matthew Shepard's murder was happened when I was 17 and it's probably why I do what I do I might think about it a lot um and I also think about the fact that if he weren't a white attractive gay man he wouldn't have gotten media attention and so there's just a lot of like yeah there's a lot of weight with that well thank you um I want to give you your five minutes Bruce uh, you don't have to use them but uh, if uh, whatever you want to share, you got you got five minutes. Yeah, I like I I think I dropped in just how proud I am that we are moving to a state of being able to talk about helping people thrive and not just sort of survive. Um, and um, launching the point and having a consistent staff member in our Kudipak programming position has allowed us to sort of weave together behavioral health prevention services, case management recovery into all of our work. Um, and so I think that the strength of what we're doing is it's all trauma informed. It's all grounded in understanding the realities that diverse folks face even inside of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and the two pieces that I wanna call out because I think they're the two pieces that are least likely to get funded and that I am writing into everything I can right now is the basic needs assistance and the document assistance. Um, if you can't find a job and you also can't afford to eat or get your ID changed to reflect what you look like right now, um, it makes it even harder to fix that problem, to find housing, to take care of your family. And so um, anywhere we can get money to help folks navigate that bureaucracy and to help folks sort of um, meet their basic needs while they do it so that they can build a strong foundation for themselves and their families, um, saves their lives and improves all of our communities, particularly poignant for people of color, particularly poignant for trans people. Um, those two things are the hardest to fund. Foundations don't want to fund it. Government don't want, doesn't want to fund it. People don't want to donate to it. Um, 
but it is actually the thing that makes pretty much the biggest difference. And, and that's research talking. That's not just an opinion. That's sort of best practice. And so that would be the hard ask that I would make is, um, let's find a way to get people the assistance that they need, the assistance they need to have documentation that it appropriately reflects who they are while they build a steady foundation to sort of live and work on. And my my last thing will be, I've done nonprofit work for 20 years, except for a brief stint in, in government in Louisiana. And I think the challenge is always to provide services and to lift people up and not to just organization build. And um, I'll be honest and tell you that if in three years our work is not sustainable, we've done it in a way that it's lifted up families and lifted up people during that time that are on better footing and not just in a way that invests money into the organization's infrastructure. Um, I think we are sustainable and I think we will be. But to the families we're helping right now and the people we're helping right now, they don't care if we're still here in five years. They care right now if we help them get documentation that reflects who they are and the behavioral health services they need and the community that they need. And so that to me is sort of the driving ethos of what we do. And that is why when you look at our annual reports, you see that we have just a remarkably high amount of money spent on programs and services compared to operations. Well, good, because we don't fund general operations. <laughs> Um, uh, well, we... thank you for that. <laughs> um, that that you know, Marty would feel better if you did. Probably that's her stress. I get to stress <laughs> about this part. Of I get it. it. I'm I've, quite I've, been on, I've been on that <laughs> side, Bruce. And general laws are always the hardest things to fund. But unfortunately, our our funding was always set aside for programming uh, expenses. So, all right. Well, want to thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate the work you all do. Um, and our um. Uh, just uh, grateful to see you and um, have a good rest of your night. Um, if I share one more thing, when I was trying sure, to get in, the, I believe um, someone typed and asked me a question and the system wouldn't let me answer it. And oh. so just a heads up, I don't, I'm on a Mac. Um, when I was in the waiting room, they asked who I was. Oh, no. Me. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was Brenda. She was, she, um, I, I think she was expecting Marty. But, yeah. So she, so my bigger concern was just letting you know that if you ask someone else that they may not be able to respond because I couldn't respond. I had to log out okay. and make sure I changed my name to log back in so she knew who I was. That's all. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you, Bruce. Have a good night. All right. So uh, before we let the next person's in, Brenda, it's the same agency and they're applying for two programs. So typically when we do that, we just give them an extra you know, either we, we, we give them 20 minutes total and, and, and the five minutes, 20 minutes for questions and answers. We typically don't do the whole 50, 30 minutes, you know, giving them 15 minutes. Um, so, so we're going to tell them that, that they're going to get, we'll give them, and not that we'll use, you may not all have, we might not have questions that fill up 20 minutes, but we'll give them, we'll give them, we'll take 20 minutes to uh, 15 for questions and five for their turn instead of giving them the usual 10. Does that sound okay to the group? Because they're asking for two programs, but the same agency. Yes, Caitlin. Um, or do we do it differently like, in the past? Huh? I, I think the last time we had one of these, I'm just going to throw out there, is we asked them to start with a quick like overview of the two programs that they okay. were asking for. And then we like meet. We tr for some of them, we split the questions. But at least if they give an if they give like a two minute like elevator pitch of what the two programs are and how they distinguish them so that we like can be clear about the differences between them. That's okay. super helpful. All right. Okay, I will, I will. Go ahead. ice cream on your lip there. Ah, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> All right. So that's I'm what we're going to do. I'll have the. <laughs> I want ice cream too now. <laughs> <laughs> I will have them explain their, their organization for two minutes and then we will give them 15 minutes of questions Again, we don't have to use them all, and then we'll give them five minutes to share at the end. All right? Okay, Brenda, uh, go ahead and let them in. Let them get connected. All right. Corey, can you hear us? I'm assuming HG that is Amy. Is that Amy? Am I getting your name correct? 
Uh, Anya. 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 Sorry. <laughs> I can't read in, at night some of these screens. Uh, oh, yeah. So welcome. Thank so you. a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, so because you guys are applying for uh, the same agency for two programs, what we'd like to do tonight um, is give you a couple of minutes to just go give us a quick overview of the two programs, and then we're going to jump into our question and answer time. And because there's two programs, we're going to give ourselves 15 minutes for questions, and then at the end, we'll give you another five minutes if there's anything else you to share. To share. Um, also, just want to let you know that this is a public hearing, so it is being recorded and will be on the City of Longmont's YouTube page. Um, and what I'm going to do before I give you your two minutes to, to give us your overview is I'm going to introduce our board members uh, and our staff, and then I'll give you a chance to, to introduce yourselves and give us a just a, a brief overview of, of both programs, and then we'll jump into the, the question and answer time. So I'm going to start uh, on my top left, which is Kimberly. Good evening. My name is Kim Stringa, and I've been on the advisory board for three years. Alejandro. Alejandro Prieto, I've been on the advisory board for a year. I mean, this is my first year. <laughs> I know, we, we put you to work fast. Martha. Martha Wilson, um, I'm also um, new to the board this year. So this is my first year. Caitlin. Hi, Caitlin Abbott. This is my fourth year on the board. All right, Christina. Christina Pacheco, I'm Human Services Director, and I've been in the position since December, but with the city since 1999. And you know me, Eliberto, I'm the Project Coordinator for Human Services, and um, you don't see her, but Brenda Palacio is our Executive Admin, and she runs everything behind the scenes. She schedules these, and I know you all connect with her quite a bit. So I'm going to give you guys a couple of minutes to go ahead and just talk about your programs uh, give us an overview, and then we will start our official 15 minutes Q&A. Again, we don't have to use all that time if the board doesn't have that many questions, but we'll make sure you get your five minutes as well. So why don't you go ahead and start. Tell us about your programs. Yep. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, again, Corey Hollister with Medicine Horse. I'm the executive director, and uh, Medicine Horse has been in operation for 23 years. Our work is equine facilitated psychotherapy and learning. Um, and horses are partners in this work. Uh, we currently have uh, two grants uh, uh, that we've submitted, one for youth programming. And within that youth programming, we have two different series, uh, one titled Rainbow Wranglers, and this is for LGBTQ plus youth. And the other one is Giddy Up, and this is for BIPOC youth and uh, also includes a parent component to it uh, with the parents uh, participating in the first and last session. The second program that we submitted a grant for is our Operation Be Heard program, and this is a veterans program. And uh, that is a quick overview of the programs. All right. So again, because you're, we're going to be asking questions about the, the both programs, we're going to give a little more time than we typically do. Uh, we're going to give you 15 minutes. Uh, not that we'll use that whole time, but the board will have that time to ask questions about your programs. All right, starting the timer. Alejandro, you're up first. Quick with the click. Um, so is, is it correct to assume that there's not a location in Longmont? Uh, no, actually, uh, in November of last year, we moved to County Line Road. So we were previously located in Boulder. Um, we're excited. This is a 33-acre ranch that is our own location. So really is going to give us an opportunity to expand programming and connect with the Longmont community more. So uh, we're excited to be in Longmont now, and uh, we're growing partnerships and connections uh, every day with our new location. That is awesome. You just answered my three questions. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Caitlin. Hello. Um, congratulations on the new space. I think when we did the the interviews last year, you all were, were uh, finalizing um, that. So um, congratulations. Um, I am curious. Um, 
what trends, you know, so I think both of these programs have previously been funded by the city of Longmont, but I'm curious what, um, what, if any trends you're seeing in terms of the need for the services or um, anything in terms of the, the needs of the folks that are attending each of the programs? Yeah, and uh, Anya may have some to add. Um, you know, I think the the need for the programs um, has has not lessened um, by any amount. Uh, I was recently at a another event with some uh, school uh, uh, administrators uh, presented there, and and they said mental health was the number one challenge they were seeing with kids. Um, so we recognize that that's ongoing, um, both in the LGBTQ plus and veterans population. Suicide is still a major challenge, um, although we have been continuing to evaluate and adjust the programming. Uh, one of the changes that I mentioned was uh, for the Gideon program, uh, including the parents in the first and last session, because we really recognize that uh, creating that bonding component for the families and, and helping the families to connect to what the kids were learning was going to strengthen that the lessons uh, that they were receiving and being able to translate those into the home and beyond just uh, being at the ranch with us. Oh, uh, Anna, you're uh, muted. If I could add something to that, I just wanted to say that uh, our Operation Be Heard programs are always full. Uh, just sometimes those are people who are coming back we would like to reach out to new partners to have every single time like new uh, people introduced to those programs uh, plus also um, uh, our lgbtq plus uh, program uh, rainbow wranglers um, i think that addressing the needs that they are uh, very big and uh, boulder county because like um, i think that we have this data in our uh, application but last year um survey uh, among the LGBTQ plus uh, population in Boulder, they said that, and it was specifically to youth, 45% of them said that do not, do not have access to mental health because uh, they can't afford it. And our program is for free. Alejandro? That leads me to, so the Be Heard, and thank you so much. It's, it's I love horses since I was like three years old. I used to go to the ranches in DR and steal me a horse. I always asked them if I was okay riding them. And they, they said, okay, I'm out. Anyways, um, the Be Heard now is 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 for the veterans. Um, do you also, I don't think I read this, but um, so that's why I'm asking. Do you serve veterans that fall through the cracks? So the ones that do not get uh, for any reason are qualified to get any of the veteran um, official benefits. So uh, I've had battle, battle buddies that were at war with me, but unfortunately because of a DUI or something, they got um, dishonorable. Uh, we, we definitely would not uh, uh, reject uh, participation. We have, as our primary recruiting partner, has been the Boulder VA. So that would make me inclined to say that those individuals have qualified for services. But uh, one of the components we've recognized is to uh, better reach uh, diverse populations and minorities that we really need to expand our recruiting partners. So uh, we have actively been... Uh, uh, trying to reach new recruiting partners. There is a strong referral component from uh, people that have been through the program that may be reaching some of those. It's not something that I've specifically tracked, but um, as you mentioned it, it, it's something that I would be interested in examining a little bit more. And then we are publicly uh, promoting awareness campaigns to be able to attract participants who can sign up that don't come through the Boulder VA as well. And then the follow-up would be then, if you do reach that population, um, how will or how would they um, uh, do? They have to pay. Is it also also a free program or no? Uh, all all our all our programs are free to the participants. Sold. Thank you.
right, I'll let Martha, I'll let you go first and then uh, I'll go after that. Hi, okay, thank you. Um, I, I'm a therapist myself um, and I have just seen amazing work through equine therapy, especially for people who um, uh, are not necessarily verbally expressive or who um, have some neurodivergence to them. Is there anything specific for this population in, in either of these programs? Um, well, I, th I think uh, those are the, the individuals that we as well really see benefit through these programs where potentially traditional modalities have not been as successful. Um, you know, it really is relational work. The horses are mirroring how individuals are showing up and allowing them to have that, uh, you know, learn within themselves that emotional regulation and that mindfulness. Uh, so I would say that, you know, in large part, that's the participants that we're attracting. And uh, definitely, um, you know, I, we've had a, a veteran that uh, commented anecdotally that he made more progress uh, through this program than he did in 23 years of talk therapy. Amazing. Awesome. Um, so before I, I turn over to Caitlin, I think whoever else had their hand up, let me add, I, um, can you, you know, our, when the board reviews your application, they're really looking at the programs. So you're gonna hear a lot of program questions from the board. They wanna make sure that it aligns with our priorities and it provides the activities we want uh, in Longmont or for Longmont residents. Staff looks at, at your agency level type of thing. So the first thing I wanna say is, I looked at your at your your board diversity and I wanna you know give you kudos because you, Medicine Horse is another one of those agencies that we've been working on trying to get more diverse. And uh, I feel like you've done a good job of increasing the board diversity of your board. Uh, but I'm very curious, um, uh, looking at your financials and also thinking about wanting to ask about this new uh, this new 33 acre uh, ranch that you're going to be at and, and just wanting to know more about, I mean, your strategic goals are great. They're, they're primarily programming. I see you want to increase by 30% uh, your programming. But talk to me about how do you make how do you make yourself sustainable with, you know, this new bigger plot? I think you had like 10 acres before. It was, it was smaller, right? I, so, but, the, so how do you, how do you yeah. make that sustainable? Yep. The the big component about uh, moving to this new location is it allowed us to uh, create a, a border aspect to the organization. So uh, we have boarders who pay to board at the facility, and then any of the boarders uh, agree to put their horses into the therapy program. They're typically maybe are not uh, the horses are approaching retirement, or they had a child that was very active and uh, now they're going off to college. So these are people that uh, want their horses in the therapy program. They're very aligned with the mission and what we're doing. Uh, we evaluate the horse prior to allowing them to board within the facility, um, but uh, we have space for up to 20 horses. We have about 16 right now, uh, three of which are medicine horse horses and 13 are boarders. And those boarders are offsetting the cost of the facility to allow us to uh, carry that larger property. Awesome. Good, good to hear. So that's how you can make it sustainable. Okay. And it sounds like it's also a good, it's, it's, it's a, it's a win, I guess a win-win because you also get more horses that, that hopefully will also help uh, the, the, the therapeutic side of the program. Well, and, and that's absolutely true because the, the horses, uh, they, they will get burnt out themselves. There's a, uh, you know, working with uh, PTSD and, and, and kind of intense trauma puts a lot of work on the horse as well. So, uh, you know, that was a limiting factor for us in being able to expand programming before. So now that we've expanded the herd and have more horses to work with, this allows us to expand programming. All right. Any any more questions for, for Corey and Anya? I just need to make a site visit, that's all. Well, <laughs> well, we, well we, 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 I'm sure that they're, they're on the, they're on the list and I always welcome board members to come with me to do site visits. I always enjoy the site visits. I, I promise not to steal a horse. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if there are no other questions, uh, you actually had about four minutes left, but I'm going to stop that and I'm going to give you all five minutes to share whatever 
you want to share. And again, you don't have to use it all, but I uh, I will start the timer and you have five minutes to share. Uh, appreciate that. And uh, just, it's a pleasure being here and thank you everyone for your time. Um, I, I think most importantly, we, we are excited to be uh, a member of the Longmont community now with our, our new location and uh, feel very excited to um, make connections. We've made some wonderful connections with the, the Main Street School and the St. Brain Valley School District uh, and serving youth uh, in the community and uh, uh, are actively developing partnerships and relationships so that we can uh, continue to meet our goals of growing programming and uh, being a uh, quality community partner uh, here in the city of Longmont. If, if I can add something, I just want to say that today I met uh, um, uh, Longman Children uh, Youth and Family Services and I already signed up for a tour so you guys also welcome and uh, we hope that we will uh, be able to introduce you to our animals and to show you around. Well, that's awesome yeah the making partnerships is really key and important part of the work. All right so if there is nothing else I want to thank you for your time uh, thank you for the work that you do uh, and we hope that you have a great rest of your night. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. All right, so our last participant isn't here yet, but right. and that's, a, that's a good thing because it gives us a chance to talk a little bit about this program. Uh, right. And about, you want to take this, Christina? Yeah, yeah. And I didn't, um, I neglected to mention that um, that Rise Against Suicide was also funded. So, um, so we got um, about almost a million dollars of funding through the sale of the Bronco Stadium. And so we did a, another funding cycle um kind of parallel to this process um kind of modeled it after this and longmont youth council um was the advisory board for those funds so rise against suicide it's one-time funding so for this next year um rise against suicide um, was one of the awardees um they only got eight thousand dollars um, and there, we know that their ask was 25,000 from, from this, um, these funds. So I just wanted to put that, um, out there in terms of context and with restart studio, um, they, uh, they actually serve our juvenile diversion population and, um, they uh, received uh, 22.5 in uh, Metro Stadium grant funds, and their application here is for 22.7. So I want to ask about that um, and make sure that uh, it's not a duplication, um, you know, that, that they're going to get funded twice for the same thing. So I'm interested to, to hear about that. Um, and that really was going to be my question for this group. I'm not so much worried about the 8,000 for, for Rise Against, but um, I just wanted to make sure um, with this with this program specifically. So is that what you were going to talk about, Eliberto? Sorry, yeah, I was just finishing my strawberries. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, that, I mean, I think, and, and, and I don't know where, which other priority areas that you all are in but we have a few other a examples few. of of that happening yeah of, we, thought uh, we would just bring them up to um bring them up to the group as we as they as they as they came about yeah because i think i think i think to christina's point is i think it's important that we ask the are you asking for the exact same amount or, or the exact same program you know from both from both uh, funding. Now, to be fair, the 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 Denver Metro one is is a one time deal, it's right? Just one time, right? We're right. not getting that again. But does that mean do they wait until next year, right, uh, to, and and apply again to human services? So I think that's a legitimate question. Um, I don't know if you all have any thoughts on that, but just wanted to make sure that we uh, we let you know that that's that's happening. And for any of them. 
did they include um I did not I don't I'm was trying to pull up the PDF. They didn't include that in their budget because they applied for this before they found out, right? Right. 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 Yeah. They didn't find out till last week. So they you know, they might have just been throwing darts just, on the wall trying to say hey, right. just applying. We need, this, for, we yeah. need this money and whoever wherever we get it, we will yeah. take it. Where well and, and in some cases it may just be that like, you know, the, the program budget is higher than than both of them combined. And so like they it actually, could be that could be the answer. Right, right. That could be the answer. You know, it's a, you know, hi, we have a program budget of a hundred thousand and we need, you know, we're gonna right. see how many different places we can fund it from. Right. And, and um, you know, in, in this case, if if they have a program budget, for example, I mean, I'm not saying that this is the case, but if they have a program budget of um of 70 or, or $60,000 and they're asking for 44, um, almost 45,000 from the city. Is that something okay? Is that something that, that this group is, um, is okay funding or, um, is the expectation that, you know, they really should be looking for a more diverse funding stream and not depending solely on on city funding for more than 50% of their program budget. So I mean, right. just something to put that I in front. Two follow-up questions. Uh one is am I correct that like the law did the Longmont Youth Council make recommendations similar to what we're doing to like city council for approval of those? They just mm -hmm. make the decisions right like they so just made the decisions yeah city council is not going to um, review those and in fact i just wrote the communication and did it as an info item it'll go on october 24th but we didn't we they didn't say come back and we'll approve they just said you know we trust that that you'll yeah. you'll make the right decision so that's what and, I thought. And, and I mentioned that because, you know, obviously ours goes through that approval process. And so maybe because those are very actually two different places for funding, we maybe we don't maybe we don't care that they're getting it from both places unless there's some like you said, like there's concern that like they're not going to be able to make it happen because we're like, you know, the grants are funding, you know, right. Other, but. Well, yeah. And I think the other thing to think about, though, is the amount of ask that we got um, that, you know, more than $2 million. And I mean, the need is definitely out there. And so I think looking at financially what the program budget is and what the total funding would be from the city and what potentially that $20,000 could, I mean, maybe it could cover and I'm not saying that this is the 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 situation, but just to kind of put everything into context, okay. could that fund something else? Uh, my second quick question, Eliberto or Christina, maybe you know, um, are the contracts for the those funds do they are they similar or basically the same as what like the contracts for our funds are? Like, do they have the same type? I assume that they're being approached in the same manner in terms of like here you ha still have to deliver on what your program says and that type of thing yes yeah well yes yes and, and. Yes, and. <laughs> Go ahead. so so the so the applications for the metro district was, was not nearly as robust as our application was so there's going to be some more negotiation and um yeah we're going to have those conversations but yes there i mean fundamentally they're similar um, and they're going to be a little different just because it, it's a different type of funding. And, right. you know. and they're smaller. There's some smaller organizations and agencies that applied. And so we're looking at, you know, insurance requirements and we're just trying to make things. As yeah. For example, one of the big things like we, as possible. Yeah. We just want the money out the door. Disclaimer, I know someone who received one of those grants. I, I know someone uh, who received them too, and we're trying to yeah. make it easy for small businesses, FYI. I was going to say, that's the other big difference. We have multiple small businesses get funding. So not nonprofits, but actually just regular for-profit small businesses. And so we're figuring that out too, right? So yeah. most we're of the trying... funds here go to nonprofits or governments. Yeah, we're trying to make it as easy as possible. Yeah, I will say, 
Caitlin, I used the standard deviation and it worked really well. It did. Uh, so it, did. it had its first uh, its first go run, and we and and I I didn't have to do like a one point five or a two. It worked just fine with one standard deviation. So we'll see for hours, but it worked just fine for one standard deviation. It was great. It was great. Love it. So Word. so thank thank you for doing that. That's going to be a legacy right there. That it just it 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 it, it made it look it, it made it much easier. Uh, and, and it was much more responsive to the scores. And I will say those kids were really thoughtful. They had some amazing comments uh, about all the applications. So, so yeah, so it's 730 and they are waiting in the, in the waiting room. I will we can go ahead and let them in and I'll do my little spiel and we'll get going. And that's our last one for the night. All right, Amanda, welcome. Hello there. Can you oh. can you hear us? We oh we lost you lost your video. That's all right. But can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. All right. Good. All right. So okay, I'm gonna go. get, I'm gonna do a little bit of housekeeping before we get started, and then uh, we we can go uh, and jump on in. So um, this first thing I want to say this is a public hearing, so it is being recorded and will be on the city's YouTube uh, site. Um, you're going to have 10 minutes of Q&A from the board, and then you'll have five minutes to share anything you want to share. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the board and, and staff, and then I'll give you a chance to, to introduce yourself, and then we will go right ahead into the, um, the Q&A. So I'm going to start on my bottom right this time. I've been, I've been jumping around where I start. Martha, you go first. There she is. Hi there. This is Martha Wilson. It's my first year. Oh, we saw her and then she. <laughs> That's right. Okay, Caitlin. Hi, my name is Caitlin Abbott. This is my fourth year on the board. Alejandro. Alejandro Prieto, this is my first year on the board. Kim. Hi, I'm Kim Strenga. This is my third year on the board. Now we'll go to staff, Christina. Hi, Amanda. You know me, Christina Pacheco. I'm now the human services director for the city. And hi, Amanda. I'm Liberto Mendoza. I'm the project coordinator. I work under Christina Human Services. Uh, who you don't see on uh, is Brenda Palacio. She is our executive admin. She is the wizard that makes everything happen behind the scenes. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself real quickly, and then I'll start. The, I'll start the uh, the timer. Yeah. Um, well, nice to meet you all. Thanks for welcoming me here. I'm Amanda Holst. I'm the executive director and also the art therapist at Restart Studio. All right, and I'm going to start start the start the timer. Alejandro. Yeah. So my question is. Um... Are you all doing anything to diversify the board? Um, you know, I'm a strong believer as then, you know, serve the ones that being served are more comfortable being served by people that look like them mm -hmm. and feel like them sometimes. Do you have any with active or, I mean, lived experience? Things of that nature. Yeah. Yeah, great question. Um, it's something that is super important to us and therefore on our radar of wanting to diversify our board. And so um, we definitely have plans in in this fiscal year to be able to expand our board in that way. Um, and what that looks like is really, um, you know, finding good connections and sending that invite to people that do represent the clients that we're serving um, and also have some sort of knowledge, expertise, background in um, some aspect of what our program is doing as well. So whether that is, um, you know, someone, law enforcement, someone from the city, um, someone with more um, also like the holds the diversity thing and also um and also can can say that they're 
have been or in some way involved in the um, criminal justice system as well. Does that feel like it answers your question? Thanks. Kim. Yeah, there's no wrong answer. It's your answer. So, yeah. <laughs> but yes, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm kind of to tag along with um, Alejandro's question is I noticed that all the therapists currently only speak English and I was wondering if there's any efforts to have uh, Spanish speaking therapists on board. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that we would absolutely love and something that, um, you know, definitely is considered as we go through our interviewing process in hiring more therapists on. It's something that, um, again, is important to us. Um, I found in, in kind of trying to find those applicants, they are much more limited. Um, and so that means for us, while we're going through that hiring process, you know, really making sure that we're expanding our resources and our hiring posts, all of that in, in wider places, um, so that we can really get a wide variety of, of applicants and, um, and be able to hold that door open, that hiring window open a little bit longer to hopefully get more. Um, and some of those being bilingual. Awesome. Any other questions from board staff? Oh, uh, Caitlin and Christina. Amanda, I wonder if you could talk a little bit um, about um, how you see, you know, you're relatively, you're providing services to, you know, a, a subset of folks who need mental health um, support and care. And so um, how do you, um, who are the, who are these folks and why, why is art therapy better than for that for them than you know mm -hmm. sort of traditional modes of therapy yeah great question um so it feels like there's almost two points there one who are we serving um maybe why of why we're serving that population um but then more specifically a question about why art therapy um and why is that beneficial for this population um so we serve justice involved youth, meaning youth that are involved in the criminal justice system. Um, so far, all of those referrals have came from the city of Longmont's um, Rewind program. And we'll actually be opening up our programming to also be able to serve at-risk youth in more of a preventative way. Um, and, and so with that, um, the why art therapy question. And this is something I could totally nerd on about and like way expand the time here. So I'll try to keep it brief. Um, but yeah, you know, um, art therapy in general, I feel like really offers a unique way to express and process through feelings that isn't necessarily always accessible through talk therapy, um, especially when it comes to difficult experiences and trauma. There's not always words to describe those experiences. And, um, and so art offers an alternative way to really access those feelings, those emotions, and, um, and, you know, being able to further reflect on things through metaphor and and just bringing that internal emotions and putting it out into a physical form um, is really transformative and really helpful to further process and reflect on. Um, with this specific population, youth that are involved in the criminal justice system, um, you know, they're they're either talk therapy to out. Um, and so they're resistant because they're like, I'm not going to do that. It hasn't been helpful in the past. Um, and so this offers a, a new way 
um, for them to explore what's going on in their lives. Um, also, I feel like a lot of the youth that I work with, um, not super trusting of authority types for, for good reason. Um, and I feel like art therapy really offers um, a less threatening way to talk about, especially, you know, difficult feelings. Um, and so it kind of breaks through that resistance to therapy. And so we can get much more out of a process that involves art and art making um, than just sitting down talking about our feelings. Great. Thank you so much. You're thank welcome. You, Christina. Christina, you were up. Okay. Um, thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so um, I'm aware that um, you you received a, a, a phone call or a, a letter um, letting you know that you were awarded funds through our Metro Stadium grant funding. Um, and that was, a, I, I believe, 22-5 mm -hmm. um, that you were awarded. Um, and you applied for 227 for this program. Can you um, talk about, um, you know, is there a difference in those applications? Um, is it a, a duplicate program? Can you talk about how, you know, how can you can you talk about that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so that, Okay, yeah. So the Metropolitan Football District Stadium funds, um, yes, is for a very similar amount. And that will help us kind of close the gap for our current fiscal year. Um, what this funding would allow us to do is continue and sustain our programming for all of 2024. Okay. Um, and then what also is a little bit different too is this application is really about sustaining our current current program. Um, and if if we get more funds, we'd be able to kind of scale up capacity by hiring someone. But that's a side note. Um, and the football funds um, really... In addition to... Um, was allowing us to then expand our program to offer services to youth that aren't in the Rewind program. And so with those funds, um, we will be expanding our program a little bit to offer a art therapy group that is open to the community. Um, and then also that um, art therapy one-on-one -on -one for at-risk youth in more of a preventative lens. Um, and all of this, through both funding sources um, allows us to provide our services free of charge. And so really um, creating, you know, access to mental health services that otherwise a lot of these youth wouldn't be able to obtain. Thank you, Amanda. So our time is up, um, our 10 minutes are up. I will give you now your five minutes. Um, if there's anything you uh, want to uh, share with the with the board members present tonight, thank you. Um, I guess what I was really excited to share is the like why art therapy question, um, because I think it's something that you know is is obviously a big part of our program. It's really unique that other programs aren't offering, and and so I guess I just really want to you know, stress that, that it's um, an alternative way and a proven effective way at reaching this population. And there's not access to that, um, at least in an affordable way in, in our community otherwise. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for being here tonight. We appreciate your time and and your answers to our questions. If, um, yeah, if the board has any more questions, I will follow up. Um, okay. Sounds great. Thank you all and enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you. All right, team. Um, Thank good you. job. We, we have gone through the priority health